Lewis structures, non-octet breaking. Our goal for this video is to draw the Lewis structures for molecules that follow the octet rule. And as a part of this, we're also going to learn how to assign formal charges for all the atoms within a molecule. You need this to make sure that you're drawing the right Lewis structure. It's tough to make hard and fast rules for things such as Lewis structures, but there are some guidelines that are going to help you draw them correctly. Step one is very, very important and is often skipped as people start to get more comfortable. I would urge you to continue to do this though. It is an important step in knowing how many electrons you have to work with and being able to double check at the end that you have accounted for them all. From here, you want to draw out a skeletal structure. This means setting up each atom separated by a single bond. Your least electronegative element, normally the one written first, is going to go in the center. From here, you'll know how many electrons you have left. Distribute these among each of the atoms. If you have enough to complete all your octets, then great. Though often you won't. When this happens, you'll need to add some double or triple bonds. This means that the atoms will share more electrons, being able to complete their octets. For every two electrons that you're short, you'll need to add one more bond to the structure. The last thing you'll need to do is to check formal charges. We'll talk about this more a bit later, but I wanted to list it here for completeness. We'll also discuss more about the exceptions to the octet rules in the follow-up video to this one, where some atoms just don't follow the octet rule. They either have less or more on a pretty regular basis. Before we get too far into our discussion of Lewis structures, we need to discuss a concept called formal charge. This is the charge that the atom would have if all of the electrons in the bonds were shared equally. It's determined by taking the electrons that the atom owns in the molecule, so their lone pairs, and one from each bond, and then subtracting that number from its original valence electrons. The original valence electrons we find from the periodic table. As far as how many it owns in the molecule, though, its lone pairs are counted completely as that atom's own. So if an atom has three lone pairs, that's six electrons that that atom has for itself. It then gets one electron from each bond. So if it has three lone pairs and one bond, that would equal three times two, six from the lone pairs, plus one from the bond equals seven electrons. This is gonna make more sense as we do lots and lots of examples along the way. Let's start with N2. N has five valence electrons from the periodic table, and both of them do. So that's 10 electrons. In this case, we just have two atoms, so we can go ahead and place the two atoms apart from each other with a single bond in between. The single bond uses up two electrons, so we have eight electrons left. What happens if we try to distribute these? Well, we can see that we don't get a octet on each one. We're actually short four electrons. And this is four electrons or two bonds worth, so we're gonna need to add in two more bonds. Now, in this case, we don't have a lot of choices because we really only have one place we can add them to, and so we're gonna add them in like this. And now we can distribute our remaining electrons. So here we have six electrons in the bonds, seven, eight, nine, 10 electrons. So all of our electrons are accounted for. Now, for our last step, and this is important, we want to check our formal charges. Well, in a case like this, we didn't have a lot of options, and so formal charge isn't going to make too much of a difference. In other cases, we may have to use formal charge to actually decide on the structure. So let's practice now. This nitrogen 
had five valence electrons from the periodic table. In this molecule, it gets to keep the two electrons from its lone pair, and then it gets one of each of the bonding electrons. So that's five electrons minus five electrons is a formal charge of zero. Now let's look at the other one. Should feel very similar. It has five valence electrons from the periodic table. It has its two lone pair electrons and it gets an electron from the bonds, one from each. So this is five minus five equals zero. As a general rule, you want to minimize formal charges. So if you're able to, without breaking any other rules, you want to make the formal charges as low as possible. And by here, low means closest to zero. Now let's look at a little more complicated one. We can go to our periodic table and see that boron has three valence electrons. Hydrogen has one, and we have six of them. And then nitrogen has five. This gives us 14 electrons. Now, this structure is set up to help us draw it. The way that it's written is showing us that there is a boron with three hydrogens. When you see formulae written out in a way that is designed to show you the structure, you can trust that. It's not chemists trying to trick you. It's showing you that these are kind of like two segments bonded together. And this is a very common way of writing molecules to help you know what they look like. If we look at this, we can see that we had to distribute all 14 electrons in order to form the skeletal structure. So we don't have any more electrons and everything has an octet except for the hydrogens, which aren't supposed to. Hydrogens are supposed to have what we call a duet or two electrons and they all have that. So everything is happy to anthropomorphize a bit. Now let's do our formal charges. Hydrogen, all the hydrogens are the same, so I'm just gonna do it once. It comes in from the periodic table with one valence electrons. It gets one valence electron from its bond, so one minus one is zero. And that's true for every hydrogen on this structure. So you can hopefully walk through and see that for each one. Boron had three valence electrons from the periodic table, but now it has one from each bond and it has four bonds. So that's minus four. So that's a charge of negative one. Nitrogen had five from the periodic table. Now it gets one from each bond so that's minus four. So that gives you a plus one. Now you see there's a formal charge here and here, and that's, like I said, we want to try to minimize formal charges. We want to get them to zero, but sometimes there's just nothing we can do about it. And this is one of those cases. And so those are going to be the formal charge is on that, that species. Let's do another one. This is XEF4, four plus. So remember, when we're counting electrons, we have to account for the ions too, right? We have to make sure that when we have a plus ion, we remove those electrons. And when we have a negative ion, we add those electrons in. So Xe it has eight valence electrons. It's a noble gas. Fluorine is a halogen with seven, and there's four of them. And then it's a plus four charge. So that's going to remove four electrons from our count, right? It's going to remove four electrons, so this gives us 32. We'll put our first least electronegative element in the center. We'll put our fluorines around. We'll distribute out our electrons. And at this point, you can count up the electrons and see that we've distributed all 32 electrons out. Everything has a octet and so this should be all set and good to go. We can count our formal charges. Xe came in with eight electrons. It only has four now, one from each bond. 
which gives it a formal charge of plus four. It's not particularly ideal. Fluorine has eight or seven electrons from the periodic table. It has seven electrons here. You got six from each lone pair and then uh, one from the bond. And that's true for every single fluorine. So I know I'm, I say fluorine as if like I'm, I'm talking about all of them, but really I'm talking about each one of them. So we can look at this fluorine, we can look at this fluorine, this fluorine, and this fluorine. And the same count is true of all of them. They all came in with seven electrons. They all have seven electrons in this structure. And so they all have a plus zero charge. Now that you've seen this completed a few times, I wanna give you some helpful tricks that will help you do Lewis structures more quickly. These are not hard and fast rules. They're just common patterns that will help you. All of these occur because bonding, pa uh, bonding patterns, which give the atom a formal charge of zero, while still having a stable number of electrons. So boron will often have three or four bonds in zero lone pairs. Carbon often has four bonds in zero lone pairs. Nitrogen often has three bonds and one lone pair. Oxygen often has two bonds and two lone pairs. Halogens often have one bond in three lone pairs. And then sulfur and phosphorus can kind of do two different things. They'll either be very similar to oxygen and nitrogen respectively. And if you look at your periodic table, you can see that sulfur is right below oxygen, phosphorus is right below nitrogen. And so that kind of makes sense. Um, but we'll also see in the next video that they can break the octet rule, in which case they can form six bonds or five bonds respectively. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next time. So in summary, we make Lewis structures for a molecule that follow the octet rule when, when we can, when it makes sense. And we start by counting the electrons. Then we make a skeletal structure. We distribute our electrons into double and triple bonds as needed to make sure that everything has an octet. We try to minimize formal charges. And then at the very end, we also want to always double check your electron count. That should be kind of your final step. We also will assign formal charges to check to ensure that there's a stable distribution of electrons. We didn't go into having to make that decision too much right now, and that'll get covered a little bit more when we cover um, resonance structures. And we really have to look at what are the formal charges, what are the stable resonance structures.